We've been a big fan of the Museum of Everything for the last few years and um, we've been along and seen quite a lot of the things they've doing and the feeling of what we saw really like stayed with us. Um, I think it's a, what they're doing is so fresh and new and bold, it feels very different from anything else in the mainstream art world. Um, but also what we saw when we've seen what they were doing is something, a story that's really bursting at the walls and something that really could be told on a, big, big, a much bigger platform. Um, so we asked them if they'd like to collaborate with us and they were really excited so um, that was great for us and um, I think for them it's quite a departure to move away from something that's very non-commercial into a big famous department store but at the same time I think it really excited them because they're quite used to doing things in unusual um, venues. The Museum of Everything started simply because I was looking at a kind of art material that nobody else was looking at, certainly not in the UK. And it was art by people who were self-taught, who maybe had done art as a practice just for themselves, had had a disability and were making art. All sorts of reasons that kept them out of the mainstream art world. And the work was more fascinating and interesting to me because it was made without a sense of a destination. It was just for them. To come to somewhere that, where the size and, and, and grandness of the building rivals the mainstream museum seems really an offer too good to turn down. We then had to think, well, how do we make a commercial space really resonate? How do we make it meaningful? We first of all took the windows and said, well, the street should have an exhibition separate to the main exhibition. So we curated 10 artists. And what we did is we created installations. I come from a film background. So it was almost like creating a set with the art. Not to be the art, but to give the person in the street an idea of what was inside, an idea of the creativity of the artist, and perhaps engage them enough to come into the show itself. The show itself has about 400 works, 50 artists, dozens of studios, and what we did here is we created an installation because we don't really believe in a white box, so we made it a very unwhite box. And, and finally there's a shop, and the reason we did that is simply that if we're in a shop, we ought to have a shop. Uh, we expanded what we sell, and also in this, in this day and age where money is so tight for any kind of art institution, it seemed correct to me that there should be a brand, there should be something to sell. And if we can reproduce the work of the artists and get that to a wider audience, while well, we don't want to sell art, we can communicate it further. The word art is a quite restricted word. It doesn't include any of the stuff that you see here today, although many of the museum directors will tell you that's not the case. You know it's not true because you don't see it on the walls of those museums. But at the same time, the word disabled is a very narrow word based on ability. 
we define ability very restrictively, although in fact we're all disabled. Those ideas underlie this, and when you give people, whoever they are, free range to invent, the inventions are much more interesting and dynamic than the ones that are in a prescribed form. Certainly when we started getting the work, what we looked for was evidence of an art practice, which means more than one piece, a repeated method or developments, things that engaged us, but ultimately we just said, do we like this work? Is it meaningful to us? What does it say? Is it different from somebody else's work? So you'll see similarities in themes and styles, but very often there's nothing connecting two different artists. It's, it's, as I say, it's a very unique language for each one.